I've come up to the podium many times and I don't get applause before I say anything. So it's pretty clear that that applause is for you, Justice Breyer. Uh, I am delighted to see you here and honored to introduce Stephen G. Breyer, Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. This is an extra special honor for me as I had the privilege of serving as the Justice's law clerk, as did uh, my colleagues Dan Ortiz, Rachel Harmon, and Farah Peterson. We were theorizing last night that we might uh, have the highest uh, proportion, highest number of Justice Breyer's law clerks on a faculty here, uh, and several of our graduates. Uh, so we are thrilled, absolutely thrilled, to be able to uh, welcome Justice Breyer. For most of you, and given the applause, he needs no introduction, but I will happily offer one anyway, and maybe there'll be a few things that you don't yet know about him. Justice Breyer has led an extraordinary career spanning more than a half century in government, all three branches, and the academy. He was educated at Stanford University, at Oxford University as a Marshall Scholar, and at Harvard Law School where he graduated magna cum laude. After graduating from law school, Justice Breyer clerked for Justice Arthur Goldberg on the U.S. Supreme Court. He then worked for two years as a special assistant to the Assistant Attorney General at the U.S. Department of Justice, and he began teaching at Harvard University Law School in 1967. He taught a number of courses, including administrative law and antitrust, and he really made his mark in administrative law. The field before him had been preoccupied with judicial review of federal agency action, and he emphasized the importance of understanding the substance of any given regulatory policy. And I think you'll see that as a theme. Uh, he wants to understand how it works and what it does. According to Cass Sunstein, quote, it is fair to say that as a law professor, Justice Breyer ushered administrative law into the modern era. So he was transformative even before he entered the judiciary. He continued to teach at Harvard Law School and sometimes at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard uh, for several decades, while also taking on additional positions in both the U.S. Senate uh, and the judiciary for the following 30 years. Uh, he served as special counsel and as chief counsel for the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee, working closely with Senator Edward M. Kennedy, UVA Law Class of 1959. I'm going to just keep finding the UVA Law Connections, Justice. Um, just after Ronald Reagan won the presidency in 1980 in a landslide that also brought Republicans into control of the Senate, President Jimmy Carter nominated Justice Breyer to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit. And it's my understanding that Senator Kennedy was an important part of that process, so we can take a little credit for that. Uh, <laughs> A month later, Justice Breyer was confirmed 80 to 10, and he was the only judge confirmed in that lame duck session uh, of Congress. He served as chief judge on the First Circuit from 1990 to 1994, and on August 3rd, 1994, he was sworn in to the Supreme Court by President Bill Clinton, filling the seat previously held by Justice Harry Blackman. As a person, Justice Breyer has lived life fully at every level and every moment. He mixed salads as a teenager working at a summer camp. He served six months of active duty in the U.S. Army as part of a reserve program. He dug ditches for Pacific Gas and Electric Co. the summer before he started law school. I don't know if any of you dug ditches last summer. Uh, that's on, uh, 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 on the practical side. He also taught himself French by reading Proust, all seven volumes of, and I won't even say it in French, just in English, In Search of Lost Time, in the original, keeping track of the words that he did not know on index cards as he encountered them. He has flourished in the ivory tower of Harvard University and the political hubbub of the Senate. As a justice, Justice Breyer has operated at both the level of constitutional theory and of facts on the ground. He has theorized, Cass Sunstein says, about the role of the judge more than any other justice and more impressively, in his view, than any other justice. But at the same time that he does this theorizing, it is deeply pragmatic. Justice Breyer's theory of constitutional interpretation is grounded in the real world and in the consequences of judging and legal decisions. He set forth his theory in his 2005 book, Active Liberty. He made the cornerstone of this theory, quote, participatory self-government, built on the belief that not just that government can help people, but that government is the people. 
His thesis is, quote, that courts should take greater account of the Constitution's democratic nature when they interpret constitutional and statutory texts. And this requires judicial modesty because, quote, the judge, compared to the legislator, lacks relevant expertise, but also the exercise of judicial authority to, quote, better law, to yield better law, law that helps a community of individuals democratically find practical solutions to important contemporary problems. Justice Breyer offered up this theory as a challenge to other intellectual uh, and uh, uh, theories of interpretation, originalism and textualism most uh, specifically, and he offered them up in conversation with his longtime friend and constant interlocutor, former justice and former UVA law professor, Antonin Scalia. This theory has informed major opinions uh, and off also major dissents, such as Heller versus the District of Columbia on the Second Amendment, parents involved in Seattle schools on racial inequality and equal protection, recently Glossop v. Gross on the death penalty, and so many others. To call Justice Breyer a pragmatist, as he is often called, is to flatten out what is a really unique and full approach to judging in life. It's not that it's not true, but it's really only part of the picture. There is also the humanity he shows for everyone, for those facing the death penalty, for those held in immigration detention without bail, he recently dissented from the bench on that, or for the children who he reads to on National Literacy Day wearing his cat in the hat hat. And I will say, I still have my cat in the hat hat from that day, and I wear it on Halloween. <laughs> Justice Breyer finds beauty everywhere in the world, and he finds humor, and he brings it with him everywhere he can. When he was last here at the law school in 2004, he told the following story about being the junior justice, which at that point he had been for some 10 years. Uh, he said that in the Supreme Court conference room, quote, if somebody knocks on that door, it is my job to open it. The other day, somebody knocked, and they had a cup of coffee for Justice Scalia. I thought that was going a bit too far. <laughs> Justice Breyer has enormous respect for the job that he does and the job that everyone does for a job well done and all of the hard work that goes into it. Every year, he hand signs a postcard to every Eagle Scout in the nation. If some of you are Eagle Scouts, I imagine you got a letter or a postcard from him. Despite entreaties from his staff that doing it by hand is necessary, he shakes those off and scoffs at that, saying, of course it is necessary. That is how you show due respect for the accomplishment that this deserves from one Eagle Scout to another. The brilliance, the joy, and the curiosity that Justice Breyer brings to everything he encounters is always on display, and I imagine you will see it here today. Perhaps most importantly is the respect that Justice Breyer has for the law, for his own role in interpreting it, and for the independence of the judiciary. And finally is the belief that he has in all of you and in all of us to make the law truly work. When he was here 14 years ago, he was the keynote speaker at the Public Service Law Conference. And he said, quote, we in the Supreme Court don't make democracy work. Our job is to help maintain a system where you make it work. He expanded on these views in 2010 in a book entitled, Making Our Democracy Work, A Judge's View. He recounted the Supreme Court's past infirmity when decisions were, quote, ignored or disobeyed, where the president's or the public's acceptance of court decisions was seriously in doubt. He underscored that this is not, that that acceptance, quote, is not automatic and cannot be taken for granted. Today, he talks to us about a book where he has set his sights even higher, or perhaps rather broader, outward from the US, from our Constitution, and from our court to the world. Hence the title, The Court and the World, American Law and the New Global Realities. I wish I had such pithy titles. Uh, there has been immense public praise for this book, which reflects the justice's characteristic pragmatism about how given new global realities, the justices have no choice but to take careful notice of what transpires beyond this nation's shores. Martha Minow, the dean of Harvard Law School, former, now former dean of Harvard Law School, stated about the book, quote, there is no better or wiser source on the intersection of American jurisprudence and international law than Justice Stephen Breyer. He offers insights on every page, and his attention to both principle and common sense points the way for harmonizing national and global concerns while strengthening law and reason. The Economist called this a tour de force analysis of the role of the Supreme Court vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. But enough of me talking about Justice Breyer and his book. You are all here to see him. Please join me in welcoming Justice Stephen G. Breyer.
my goodness. Thank you. I mean, that was such a nice introduction. No, I want to hear what I'm going to say. <laughs> it's amazing. Thank you. And it's so nice for me to have Risa as dean and have three others of my clerks. You, you won't understand this. You have, you know, it's like having a big family. It's wonderful. Uh, teaching here at, at UVA, it's just great, great, great. And uh, she really went into detail. I mean, you know, <laughs> what do I say? I mean, you even mentioned the regulation. The reason she mentioned the regulation book and so forth, my work on regulation, her first job when she came to, to work for me, was we had a case that for some reason involved the long-run marginal cost of electricity regulation. And what she had to do was look through maps of Chicago to discover where the power stations were. So if you have any questions <laughs> on where the power stations are, that's it. I mean, she's got it. Uh, and it is true, I did write this book. I, I, I wrote on the subject. The LA, Times, you know, the LA Times got a hold of one of these. I don't know how they decide to review this in the LA Times, but here is what they said about the book on regulation. Uh, it said, uh, in Alice in Wonderland, uh, Alice and the Dormouse emerge from the Pool of Tears, and the Dormouse uh, goes and starts to read from Hume's History of England. Uh, why are you reading that, said Alice. Well, uh, says the Dormouse, we're wet, and this is the driest thing I know. He says, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> Well, I've, I've tried to improve since then, and, and, and uh, uh, she's asked that I speak about this book called, modestly called The Court in the World. Uh, the, 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 uh, what, why did I write this book and what's it about? And then we'll, I'll do this for about, what, 20 minutes or so, and then you can ask whatever you want on any subject and I'll try to answer, but, but I won't succeed necessarily. All right, so um, the, the um, um, book. All right, why? Well, in part what I've tried to do, I, I'm, I'm focusing on the Supreme Court, but I'm trying to give a little window into what is a bigger question. Uh, again, I can use the literary analogies. In, in uh, the a good book, great book, The Charter House of Palmer, Stendhal's great, great, great book, and the, it opens up where the hero, uh, Fabrice Del Dongo, is in the battlefield at Waterloo. And uh, the bullets are roaring past and the smoke of war. And he sees Napoleon uh, you know, riding back and forth on his horse. And he thinks to himself, you know, he says, something really important is happening here. He says, I wish I knew what it was. <laughs> and that's sort of how I feel when I see these words interdependence or globalization. And, and, and what's this really about? And I can't provide a global answer to that. But I can look at our work and show you how it's changed uh, over time and give you an idea of what it means at least for one institution, namely us, because that's what I know best <laughs> at the moment. And uh, the, the uh, yeah, and I, and I do it primarily through example. But when you were there, because uh, and certainly before, it's, uh, you have no pro idea when I was there. <laughs> Yes, 1843, when I first started clerking. <laughs> I was thinking, because I just wore in uh, 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 Jennifer Neustadt as the legal counsel at the State Department. She was there the second year, and I, I confirmed that with her. And when I began there, the number of cases that had some kind of foreign implication, and you had to look beyond the borders of the United States in order to get the answer, um, zero. Very few. Very few. And uh, now, 15%, 20%. And I mean, you have to look. Nobody's going to disagree. And that's the interesting part to me, is where there's no political disagreement in the press or something. Uh, uh, you're going to get the answer only if you look beyond our shores. And that change like this will require and has required other changes. Now, I'll give you two or three examples. There are a lot more, but you, you'll see what I mean. Let me give you, I'll give you one example because it's interesting and it's sort of long wind up in a short pitch. <laughs> but uh, consider cases that are con of great importance because we, of course, well, let me start the other way. The Constitution, of course, delegates to the President and to Congress, not to the courts, the power to keep us safe, the security powers. But they do delegate to the courts the power to protect basic liberty as defined in the Constitution. 
So what happens when these two things clash? And that's more than a uh, theoretical question, uh, particularly today. But it was also true in the wars that we fought in other instances. And how does the court decide? Well, for many years, the way the court decided, like many courts, was quite simple. It more or less adopted Cicero's theory. I don't know if you know Cicero's theory. I actually had to look it up. But the, the fact is, he said, and I said something like, oh, I always forget this. It was my Latin teacher, Mr. McCarthy. He, he said, uh, um, uh, armes decant leges silant, or something like that, which I used to translate uh, as, uh, when the cannons roar, the laws fall silent. That wasn't bad. Except someone pointed out to me once, you know, the Romans didn't have cannons. And so, so that, that, that sort of wrecked that translation. But, but, but nonetheless, you get the idea. And now, look back, you see, to remember the Sedition Acts and the, uh, the Alien and Sedition Acts, and what did the court? Nothing. And uh, read sometime about Lincoln in the Civil War. I understand his problem. Uh, but he sort of defied the courts with habeas corpus. And uh, moreover, uh, he put thousands of people in the North uh, who weren't in armed force uniforms, and they were civilians. He put them in prison. And Seward, his Secretary of State, one time called in the British ambassador and said, you see that bell there? If I ring that bell, I can push any, put anyone I want in the state of New York in prison. And I put this one over here. I can put anyone I want in the, the state of Indiana uh, in prison. He said, tell me, he said to the British ambassador, does the Queen of England have such power? Now, the court did decide a case on the Civil War, an important one, after the war was over. Ah, it's a little different. Yes, that's not so hard. All right, now, go to World War I and look and see what Wilson did. Mm -hmm. What happened to free speech during World War I? And now think of World War II, where, in fact, most of us know, I hope, probably everybody, that during the middle of World War II, 70,000 American citizens of Japanese origin were taken involuntarily from their homes in California and moved into camps in the Midwest, the Intermountain region. And uh, uh, I actually, I, I met Korematsu once. Korematsu, very feisty guy, uh, uh, says, I can't do I'm an American citizen. And he brought a case. There were four or five. The general view among the Japanese was, don't rock the boat, don't do anything. Just come. I said, I'm an American citizen. They can't do this to me. And he brought a case. Korematsu, the United States, read it. And, uh, <laughs> right, right, right. And you'll see, you'll see, you see. But, but the, the uh, uh, and, I, and I, I'd met him because our next door neighbor up in Cambridge, uh, Ann Forwan, was used to be Ann Bezig, and she was the daughter of Ernie Bezig. And Ernie Bezig was the head of the ACLU where I grew up in San Francisco, uh, Northern California, and he used to play poker with my father. <laughs> and, uh, uh, <laughs> She said, oh, he's coming over. You'll like to meet him. I did. A great guy. I liked him very much. And I could understand. He was 80 some odd years old and very feisty still. Interesting. He said, sure. And he thought he was sure to win. And Bezig thought he would win. But the ACLU initially would not support them. Remember, this is 1942. And uh, Pearl Harbor was in December of 41. And the general, the Army General, DeWitt, says, we've got to move them all. And you know who supported them 100% was Earl Warren. Mm -hmm. He later said, this is one of the worst things I've done. And you know who the leader of don't put them in jail was? I mean, don't move them to camps? J. Edgar Hoover. Mm, very interesting. He said the FBI doesn't need that. Yeah. But they did. And the case came up to the Supreme Court in 1944. And uh, before it came up, two lawyers in the Department of Justice, Ernie, Be uh, uh, rather, uh, Ennis and Burling, and they looked into uh, the reasons that DeWitt had given why he had to do this. And he said, well, there was signaling. There were 743 signalings to submarines. And we don't know who did that. And we're worried about San Francisco being bombed. And, and uh, there were five spies. And, and uh, he said, let's look into that. And they got the FCC to look at it. And they came back two weeks later with a pile of papers like this. And uh, not one, they said. Not one. No, no, all these incidents of the 700, they were all like buck privates who didn't know how to work the equipment. <laughs> True. And uh, the spies, they all took place after they were moved. <laughs> I mean, really, there, there was no evidence. 
And uh, by, by the way, said, uh, uh, what I think Burling said to the uh, FCC, uh, uh, he said, how did you do this so quickly? He said, oh, we didn't do it now. We did it in 1942. We showed it to General DeWitt. He knew it at the time. Hmm? And so at that point, they say, the lawyers, we're not going to sign the brief. And uh, they called in Herbert Wexler. <laughs> she knows who that was, great law professor at, uh, at uh, Columbia. Uh, and he was running the war part of the Justice Department, and he got them to compromise. He wrote a footnote that really disowned uh, the, the army, and, uh, but it was pretty much incomprehensible. So I had always thought, well, you see, because he lost the case. The government won the case, six to three. And I'd always assumed they really never understood the footnote. Then I read the transcript. They got the footnote. Charlie Horsky, who is a great New Dealer, he represented the Japanese American Defense League, and he got up there and said, read that footnote. Hmm. Hmm. By that time, the ACLU was back in the case. But uh, the conference, which Frankfurter's notes, says the conference on the case, because the people in the majority, there were the liberals, there were the black, Douglas, Frankfurter, the people who wrote Brown v. Board of Education, okay, six to three. Black walked into the conference, and he said, uh, well, someone has to run this war, Roosevelt or us, and we can't. That's it. That was the argument. Three dissents, Roberts, technical, uh, uh, Jackson, and Murphy. Murphy, well, read that dissent. I think it was 100% right. 100% right. There was just no reason for this. And certainly 1944, there isn't going to be invasion in 1944. But they did lose, and probably for the reason that Black said. That's my own view. All right, what do we do? Later in the Korean War, for the first time that I can think of, just about, there might be other instances, but the Supreme Court said to President Truman, you cannot seize the steel mills, even though your reason is to protect the army in Korea, which is in a war. So my view of that case, and it's very interesting, it's famous for a different thing, for a kind of uh, three-part test and so forth that Jackson wrote. But, yeah, you're or whatever. But, 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 uh, in my mind, uh, the court is saying, Roosevelt, you've gone too far. Now, it's much easier to say, Roosevelt, you've gone too far when Roosevelt is dead and Truman is the president. Because <laughs> he's not quite as popular. <laughs> but that is, I think, what they were saying. And, uh, well, now what? Guantanamo. Jump to that. Four cases. Four cases, each brought by a pretty unpopular person, a detainee in Guantanamo, the driver of bin Laden, was not a popular person. Against the most powerful people in the United States, the President, Secretary of Defense, in each one of those cases, the detainee won. And uh, you could read them. Uh, the courts are open, though Congress said it was closed. Statute violates habeas corpus. That's what the court held. But I think the line that is, and this is sort of where I'm getting to the punchline of this long story, that is most important to me, or characterizes what we've done, is uh, Sandra Connor wrote, which I joined. And she says, in her opinion, the Constitution does not write the president a blank check, not even in time of war. Yeah, OK? So the reason I just quote that is because I want to put in your minds what will originally and initially and um, overwhelmingly be the question you will ask. Well, if it's not a blank check, what kind of check is it? <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> now, go read the decisions, and you will see no one likes them. One side says, what you're doing is you are interfering with the president, who has to protect us. And the response I make to that, because I joined those decisions, was, uh, well, what do you want? Korematsu? You want to go back to that? You want Cicero? Or are we past that? Yeah, I think we're past it. We don't want Korematsu. Don't go back. 
Well, then we get the other side. Why didn't you tell us about hearsay? Why didn't you tell us a few of these rules? Why were you so general? Why did you keep back uh, this sort of more narrow decision? And of course, the answer to that is because we don't know the answer to the other questions. Because we're not, you know, we don't have a direct pipeline to heaven or anything. <laughs> we are human beings in this job who have to learn from the lawyers in other places and be careful, go slowly. At least that's my view of it. But if I'm close to being right, then you will see why I bring up this story. Because you can't decide these cases today without knowing something about terrorism. I don't think you can decide them sensibly uh, without knowing, uh, say, or at least looking at how other countries, which are democracies and have similar problems, deal with this kind of thing. We have to know something. You can't just say, oh, well, the State Department, whatever they say, will be fine, or whatever defense. That's what you're litigating. I mean, certainly they'll give you interesting things to they'll think about, but, but, and the lawyers will try to develop things. So there'll be various ways with the lawyers saying, why did you do this, government? Well, why didn't you do it in a more restrictive way? And what's the need? And, and there'll be classified information. Well, what kind of rules do you have? So at least the judge can see it. And, and uh, 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 how far, far do you go? And think of the questions that are beginning to come up, and then think of it for at least a minute from my perspective, which is, how do I do this? How do we get the necessary information? See, that's just one major question that I think is out there. There's another one. There are many, many. Think of the economy. I mean, think of cases involving antitrust. I mean, we had a case involving, we have a, 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 a vitamin distributor in, uh, I think, Uruguay or Ecuador or someplace, and the, the defendant, which was part of a cartel, a manufacturer, part of a cartel with one US member, is in Holland, and uh, the, the Ecuadorian brings a suit in New York. Why did he sue in New York? Well, one reason is because the price of vitamins is so high he can't get the vitamins and he's too weak to get to Europe. That's possible. Uh, on the other hand, treble damages may have something to do with it, too. So, so, so uh, anyway, he's suing in New York, and does our law cover it? And you read the statute that directly applies to this, and good luck. <laughs> All right, so we have in that case we have briefs filed by the European cartel authorities, by France, by Japan, by Canada, by, by all kinds of countries who are telling us they too have antitrust laws. And be careful of how you proceed here. There's a word that describes it, it's called comedy, and what's wonderful about that word is you have no idea what it's about. I mean, you have no idea what it's about. It's about the foreign country, or countries and how you reconcile things. I mean, there are lots of cases where a judge today in America, maybe an antitrust case, maybe a securities case, where there's a plaintiff from Australia suing uh, in this country for fraud under these uh, security statutes, a Australian firm that sold stock on the Australian exchange, but the fraud was in buying a company or land in Florida. All right, what do you do? Again, briefs from all over the world. And the Australians saying, hey, we have securities laws too. Leave us alone, please. And, and uh, what's interesting about that case to me is uh, Justice Scalia, who wrote the opinion, which I join, is filled with citations and discussions of what these lawyers from the different countries have told us, and not just the governments. Bar associations or associations of practitioners from Holland. And that's all over the place. And you know, to decide a lot of these things, uh, there is no Supreme Court of the world. Uh, where there are clashes and so forth, uh, fine, it's easy for an American judge where you know the Supreme Court here can decide it and how these things work out. Just say, well, let them decide it. No Supreme Court of the world. So in a certain number of cases, judges here have to think, and what happens if other countries follow the same principle? That Kantian question is sometimes very helpful. Will this universalize the way in which I'm deciding this case? And what's interesting to me is there are more and more cases coming up where that is not just a theoretical matter. That is a necessary matter. Go look sometime at the alien tort statute and see. They're very <laughs> filled with interest, filled with interest in this area and importance. How many, as I'm not going to go on forever, but I could, there are a lot of cases. <laughs> but how many of you, just out of curiosity, if I, I'll give you a number. Right now, you see, look, problems now exist. Environment, health, 
safety, business, uh, immigration, all over the world, which affect us. And the way in which many people are dealing with this is through a whole range of different international systems. Sometimes just a few people discussing it. Sometimes, as in the case of antitrust protocols made with the EU's antitrust authority that are like this thick, you know. Uh, sometimes through executive agreements. Sometimes through treaties. And if you look at the treaties today, they're more and more, compared to the George Washington's time, not France and the United States agree. Whether there are 28 countries or 128 countries, and they're setting up a little bureaucracy over there. And that bureaucracy is the, uh, uh, the staff from many countries who work for this international group, and uh, they will have rules. And these rules may well bind, if not legally, at least in practice, people in more than one country. I mean, think of the, you don't have to just think of the UN. Think of the uh, International Trade Organization. Uh, think of uh, there are a lot of them. So if I asked you, and I, uh, Cassese, Professor Cassese in Italy has done a study of this. If I asked you, just a guess, off the cuff guess, how many organizations in the world do you think there are that in practice bind people or businesses from more than one nation? Okay, you get the question? Say so like, okay. So uh, I'll say, are there more than 50? How many think there are more than 50? More than 100? More than 500? More than 1,000? More than 2,000? Yeah, more than 2,000 is the answer, OK? And we belong to over 800. I sent my research assistants down. They counted them because they're registered somewhere at the, <laughs> at the State Department. And they're more than 800. And, and what will happen? Uh, what we're going to have to, I believe, eventually we'll start litigating, what is the status? I mean, when the SEC goes over to Baal and the SEC staff goes to Baal and in Baal they meet the representatives of the banks and they meet the regulators of banks from other countries and they work out certain things they're going to do and then they come back to Washington and they promulgate a rule for comment and everybody fairly gets to comment. But a few of those comments say, well, I'm doing that. You decided this already. You decided this in Baal, and you decided it in a room where I was not, and you decided it in a room where the banks were, and you decided it in a room where I didn't even have the right to come in. And somebody's going to say that there's a problem there. Uh, indeed, they're saying it already. All right? Or you'll have this where Congress may, I mean, may, we never know, but Congress may delegate a lot of power uh, to organizations of different kinds to make rules. And there are all kinds of them. I mean, I know you've heard of the ITO. Not everybody has heard of the uh, Bluefin Whale Commission. But some have. Yeah, what about the International Olive Oil Council? <laughs> See, there's another rulemaking body. <laughs> well, they're all over the place. And what is the status of this delegation? Hmm. hmm. Well, the Constitution says Congress shall have the legislative power. It doesn't say the Inter International Olive Oil Council shall have the power. Uh, but wait, if you can't delegate, how are we going to solve? I mean, how do, we, how do we resolve these problems internationally? And doesn't that sound familiar? It sounds to me an awful lot like the New Deal. Nobody ever heard of these independent agents. Well, we found a place in Crowell v. Benz and various other cases. The court worked it out. They worked something out. And will our court again have to work things out? And you who are going into fields like this, I don't think this is a field you know, for a special course called international whatever. I think it's a field that belongs in, every, uh, you know, in contracts, in torts, in, in uh, uh, commercial transactions, because it's part of the life of many, many, many lawyers. And uh, they're filled with unanswered questions. Now, you see? Well, I think there's a lot to answer. And it isn't really so much which is the great, all I have to do is go into a, a group of people who are, you know, a certain group of people and say, well, uh, I think we should read foreign decisions. I did, I had this once. There was a very good congressman, or he was a congressman from Virginia, and we were discussing this issue in a public forum. Uh, <clears throat> you know, sometimes they have a judge, and they have a congressman, and they have a, um, a professor. 
<laughs> and, and so forth. Or in any case, it was one of those forums, and he get launched into a long diatribe and about why we shouldn't refer to foreign cases. And I said, I guess that's aimed at me. And he said, yeah, it was actually. I said, well, <laughs> he said, I said let, let, let me tell you why uh, I, we do that. I said, why not I read what they say? We have similar problems. We often have similar documents. Uh, we often have similar institutions. I don't have to follow it normally, but why don't I read it? I might learn something. And he says, fine, read it, read it, read it. Just don't refer to it in your opinion. <laughs> so stupidly, not then they're no, he's not stupid. He says, stupidly, I say, oh well, and also, you know, it's helpful to them sometimes. They're not used to having an independent judiciary, very important, and they can go to their uh, legislature and say, don't cut their my pay this year, and <laughs> things like that. And they refer to us, and so it helps build the status of a judicial system. And um, he said, fine, write them a letter. <laughs> you see? So I'm writing this book for him. I'm writing it for him because I'm saying, look, I know you're not going to accept some kind of reasoning I get. I want to show you what our work is like. I want to show you. And now when you look at that, because it reflects a world that we live in, you tell me whether we should pay attention to what goes on abroad or not in these kinds of cases. And I think he has to say, yes, you should because that's how we'll get the better interpretation. So why am I writing all this? I'm writing it as I said. I want you to see what our work is like. But it's somewhat more than that, because I want him to think, I want him to think, and I think it's certainly true, that if we do not stay in a cooperative relation with these other countries working on these problems, the world will go on without us. And there will be something produced, and we'll have to live with it. And so uh, we, since it will affect us, are better off having a role than not, aren't we? But there is a reason beyond that. And the reason beyond that, which I'll conclude with, and I think we're all committed to that in, in this room, the reason beyond that is it's so obvious to us. You know, I use the example of uh, uh, Bush v. Gore, talking to some students at Stanford. I was in dissent. I heard uh, 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 Harry Reid, who probably thought I was right. And he says the most remarkable thing about Bush v. Gore is never remarked, which is despite the fact very important, affects a lot of people, and probably wrong. Was it? People followed it. There were no rocks and stones thrown in the street. Yeah. Uh, they didn't shoot each other. It's a plus. That's a pretty big plus. So I said, I know a number of you. This is at Stanford, not here. But I said, I know a number of you are thinking, too bad there weren't a few rocks and stones. <laughs> too bad there weren't. Um, I said, before you make up your mind definitely, turn on the television set and uh, look and see what happens who decide, in countries that decide to resolve their differences that way. See? And the other way, Maybe unpopular, maybe wrong. Somebody's wrong when it's 5 4. Hey. <laughs> but we'll follow it. And that's taken us a long time to get that decades, centuries. And you're never there. You're never there. I mean, it's so easy to write something that's popular and not so easy the other way. But, but you do it because that's the system. And the, 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 uh, the fact is that that's called a rule of law. So when I'm talking to an audience, I usually finish with this and say, because it's a, something that means something more to my generation, even to yours or theirs. And the, the thing I want, if you want to read one book in French, since you mentioned it, and you can even get it in translation. It's a great book. It's Albert Camus. And he wrote a book called The Plague. Fabulous, fabulous. The play, is a, it's, a, it's all an analogy. It's really about the Nazis in France in, in uh, World War II. But it's directly about a plague that comes to Oran, the city in Algeria, and how people behaved, and how they finally got rid of it. And some behaved well and some badly. And at the end of the book, at the end of the book, he says, why have I written this book? And the hero is Dr. Rieu, who's a medical doctor who helped in the play. And he says, I wrote it, he says, because I wanted to tell the story of the people of Oran, because some behave badly, some behave well, and I want people to know. But I wrote it in part, too, because uh, I wanted to explain what a doctor is. A doctor is a person who helps. 
He just helps. He doesn't theorize. He doesn't philosophize. He just helps. But really, I wrote it mostly because the, the plague germ never dies. The plague germ, that terrible part of every human being, never dies. It simply goes into remission. It lurks in the cabinets, in the halls, in the attics. It lurks one day to reawaken and once again to send its rats uh, for the education or the misfortune of mankind uh, into a once happy city. You see, that's, that, that, that's, that's how I said we're in law. Good. We're one of, not the only, but one of the weapons that people use you see, against the re-emergence or the continuous emergence of that plague germ. And so working on that together with other countries, of course, I believe, will very much help us. And that's really why I wrote it. So the justice has said he would be happy to take questions. Um, I will call on people. I see you, Roger Dean. Um, <laughs> but before I call on you, let me just say uh, we will end promptly at 2, because I know many of you have classes at 210. So if you can hold off till we break, and that way we can all go together, that would be great. Of course, if you have to leave earlier, we understand. Roger Dean. Hello. Hey. Hello, Justice Breyer. Uh, so, Roger Dean, 2L here at the university. My question is in regards to um, choices. So, you've had an illustrious career that has led you to, you know, fantastic and wonderful things. But my question is, is there one story or one situation where you've reached a proverbial fork in the road where you chose one thing over the other, where if you could go back in time, the question is, would you do it again or would you choose the other option? I think you think about that sometimes, but not as much as you think you think about it. <laughs> because this is what I, I just said to the, the other group I was talking to, but it's so true, and you see it more in your, in your life. And I, I, I mean, you, you will make, right now, you're at a stage, probably, where you will begin to make, and you have been. You've made decisions. And you'll, I hope you will make a decision, you know, and you'll have someone to love, and I hope that you have a good job, and I hope you take interest in the community. But you'll make major decisions. And Bayless Manning, who was the dean at Stanford years ago when I was thinking of going out there and teaching, he said, you know, when you make a decision like that, you only know 3% of what you need to know in order to make a sensible decision. And you're never going to know more. So if you keep your decisions within the realm of reasonableness. That is, don't become a, a trapeze artist unless you have a particular talent for that kind of thing. <laughs> but but, but uh, uh, there's no way to know, okay? So you decide. And I usually think that means lighten up. <laughs> when you make the decisions you are going to have to make. And then what happens is you decide. And the world wraps itself around you. And there'll be some good aspects and there will be some bad ones. And some good things happen and some bad ones. If you're very unlucky, they're mostly bad. And if they're very lucky, they're mostly good. And I'll tell you, to be on the Supreme Court, to be a federal judge, lightning has to strike. And we all know that. And to be on the Supreme Court, it has to strike twice in the same place. And we all know that. And uh, I mean, you know, you can control a little bit. The best you can pat yourself on the back for is you can say, well, I was on the corner when the bus came by. <laughs> and, that's, that's, and that means, you know, you did a reasonably good job. My father used to say that. He'd say, do your job and do it as well as you can. And pay attention when you're doing it to what other people say about it and what they're thinking. That's obvious. And uh, uh, maybe somebody will notice you'll get a better job. And maybe they won't. And if they don't, at least you have the satisfaction of having done that well. Yeah, there we are.
So I try not to think, oh God, if only I'd invested in Xerox in 1960. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Justice Breyer. My name is Joe Charlet. I'm a 3L here. Um, I was once at a talk where Solicitor General Varelli said that nothing has changed the office of the Solicitor General more than legal blogging, because instead of academic perspectives coming a year or two later after something arises, they're coming in real time. And I'm just wondering if you've had the impression that uh, legal blogging has changed any aspect of the Supreme Court in your practice as a judge. We change very slowly. <laughs> It's a very conservative institution, and, and partly that's certainly right, because it's worked pretty well for America on balance. And we're there just as trustees. And uh, uh, we better not make some mistake in respect to the institution uh, that worsens its position in American life. And everybody feels that way, everybody. As far as blogs are concerned, I normally don't look at blogs. I say normally, because sometimes I do. I wrote a patent case where uh, I think I said you couldn't patent something, and by stupidity, since it was highly technical, I became curious what the patent lawyer blogs were saying. Well, I mean, abortion, death penalty, you name it, nothing could have been as terrible as what I just wrote. <laughs> so, so, I mean, there we are. So I, I don't read them too often, and I don't think they've changed life too much. Hello, Justice Breyer. I'm Jury Thomas, and I work with an organization called the Campaign for Youth Justice. So I have a quick question about kids in the courts. Um, so given the, the Supreme Court's uh, cases around how kids are different than adults when it comes to the context of, of sentencing and the things that should be considered, um, I wanted to get your opinion on whether, you, whether or not you thought it's a good time for litigators to start thinking about um, revisiting the Kent decision and what's considered before a kid is transferred or treated like an adult um, in the courts? Well, first, my weakness is I don't remember cases by name, and I don't usually know them by name. I mean, I know some. I know Marbury versus Madison and Brown versus Madison. <laughs> but but, but uh, usually I just remember them by issue. But I would say as a general matter, we have very few ch cases involving children. I mean, some, of course. But family law is 99.99999% up to the states. And so if it's a family law case, we probably won't have it. Even there, by the way, we are getting a few more because parental rights or custody and so forth has become the subject of treaties. And therefore, the people who know the least about it in the entire country, namely us, are actually interpreting these things which are so difficult if we're talking about family law that a family court judge friend of mine, Eddie Ginsburg, up in Cambridge, and another family court judge friend of mine in England say the same thing. They tell somebody who's in a family law battle, <coughs> I hope you reach an agreement, because whatever you decide between yourselves will be better than what I have to decide. I say that only because I want you to see that from my point of view, we don't know much about it, and it's very important. And thus, it's state law. They're primarily, but what about the treaties? Huh? Well, why are they there? Because people marry people from other countries. And when that happens, and there are children, and there are all kinds of family law battles, well, treaties jump in, and then there we get it. So that's just one more area where we're going to have to learn something. Uh, and uh, maybe uh, you're not necessarily thinking of that kind of case. I know that. But that's, uh, that's the point I can make here. Uh, because I think that's an important point, and as for the rest of it, I would say I have to say I don't know. Thank you, Justice Breyer. Peter Bouts, I'm a 3L here. Uh, so we read a lot these days about the breakdown of collegiality in America, that there's a lot of partisanship. And to me, the court always seems to be a beacon of collegiality, where you can be friends with the late Justice Scalia and yet have these 
large disagreements about areas of the law. So could you talk a little bit about how you maintain collegiality and maybe what we could do to try and encourage more collegiality in our culture? Yeah, well, um, we do. I still can say, I mean, I've been there for more than 20 years, 23 probably, but, but the, uh, I've never heard in the conference a voice raised in anger. I have never heard in the conference one judge say something mean about another, not even slightingly, not even as a joke. You know? We just don't. It's professional. You make your point. Listen to what the other person says, which is always helpful. And particularly helpful if you want him to agree with even part of what you're thinking. What a good idea you have. At least part of it I can agree with. Let's see if we can work with that. That helps. And you better maintain a collegial attitude if you want others to think about what you think. And you better really think about what they say. Because if you're pretending to, there is nothing that's sensed more quickly on the part of another person. He's just saying that because he wants me to agree with him. Ha, 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 don't do it. <laughs> you think about what the other person is saying. Now, of course, I would like to see that. When I did work in the Senate, I, I learned the senators and the congressmen, and, the, and they will respond to what they think their constituents want, not directly all the time. But if they don't, uh, they won't be there long. And so usually I, I think, this is a little bit mean to say, which I did say earlier, but the first place to look about how to bring about a, a better attitude in the United States, I'd say the first place to look is the mirror and say, what do I think? And how much am I prepared to give? And how much am I prepared to listen to other people? And really mean it. And if, in fact, which I very much believe will happen and hope will happen, is people generally decide they want a more cooperative attitude, that will be sensed. <laughs> that will be showing up in results, and you'll get it, and you'll get it. But uh, it's, it's always easy to expect the other person to agree with you, because how right I am! I regularly think that. <laughs> and, and uh, 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 well, yeah, yeah, maybe. But you ought to listen to. It makes a little progress. I think it works, but good luck. It's a worthy objective. Working this way. Hi, Justice Breyer. Uh, thanks again for coming today. Uh, I'm currently in a seminar about the rule of law and the threats to it, and a lot of our discussions focus on whether or not uh, the conception of the rule of law uh, can exist uh, as a rights-based con conception or whether it has to be divorced from morality. So I was wondering if you could weigh in um, on whether or not you think there's space for Morality. No, I think not much law. of it is about that. Yeah, I mean, criminal law, criminal law is certainly shouldn't, in my opinion. It, sometimes that happens, uh, but it shouldn't. You shouldn't be treating a person as a criminal who hasn't done something morally wrong. And and uh, that's my own view of it. And uh, I think a lot of people share that view. And it doesn't mean they'll always match one for one. But if I have a case where the morality points one way and the, the law points the other way, I will either try to see maybe I'm wrong in thinking the law points the other way, or if I'm not wrong, at least I better explain it so people can understand it. Because law ultimately is, is uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an instrument of human beings. That's what Al Sachs and Henry Hart said in their famous book on the legal process. I never found anything better than that. It's an instrument that people use in communities so that they learn how to live together and can get the benefits of a community life in terms of peace and, and uh, social benefits and economic benefits together. And that's what it more is about. There isn't law over here and morality over there. So that's the best I can do. Hi, Justice Breyer. Thank you again for coming. Um, with how divided we are as a country right now, do you see any role for the court as an institution in bringing the country together, or do you think it's institutionally capable of doing so? No. We can't do it. I mean, you can't do it. What we can do is we can do our job. 
And uh, the best thing that we can do, do our job. And don't try to worry about whether this is going to be politically beneficial or not beneficial. You do the job. You decide the case. And you decide it without too much animosity. And you try not to do anything that would interfere with the role of people seeing the court as an institution of people who on many things think quite differently and many think quite similarly. But uh, they do try to get on. Now, people can draw what lessons they want from that. And if they draw lessons uh, in the political environment, Excellent. But, uh, gee, you do what you're paid to do there. <laughs> and that's, that's important. And just doing your job, I think, is the best thing that we can do. Thank you, Justice Breyer. I'm Cole Getty. I'm a 3L. I'm wondering, we have well-established schools of thought on how to interpret statutes. And as reference to foreign decisions and foreign law becomes more common, do we continue those? Can those translate to other cultures or other countries where the traditions may not be the same? Or do we have to start from whole cloth anew? What's your take on that? No, I mean, what you're doing is usually talking about a particular case and that they may or may not have something to contribute to that case. And in terms of the, the um, what was this? It was a good joke I, that you suddenly reminded me of it, that uh, <laughs> I think it was Roscoe Pound who said, that judge is so illiterate he doesn't know whether he belongs to the historical, sociological, or the empirical economical school of interpretation. <laughs> and I said, well, here I am. The, 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 but but the, the, uh, uh, if you look, there, there aren't enormous differences. I mean, people interpreting statutes, they all look at the words, they all look at the history, they all look at the traditions, they all look at the precedent, they all look at the purposes, and they all look at the consequences uh, in terms of written in those purposes, the relevant consequences. Everybody does that, I believe. And some emphasize the first four a little more. And uh, that's the history and the tradition and the language and the precedent, but I mean, and some emphasize the second a little more. That's the purposes and the values and the consequences. But everybody does both. I'm not going to take a statute that says vegetable and say a fish is a vegetable. A fish is not a vegetable, OK? Uh, but there's often leeway in those words. And uh, how much? Well, that's the matter of differences between judges. All right, but uh, g given that sort of approach, which I think is pretty universal, um, you take the foreign thing, if you're looking at it, for what it's worth. And I would, my, my instinct, but I'm not positive at all I'm right on this, is don't go into too much working out a tax code of how to um, uh, interpret and use uh, foreign decisions. Uh, interpretive work is not really the tax code. Approaches are not the tax code. And I have to say that's why my students had a lot of trouble with administrative law, because administrative law is not the tax code. And students love the tax code because there it is. they don't really, but I mean, they sort of like it. <laughs> you know, but I mean, there it is, pretty definite. But there are a lot of areas that aren't so definite, including what the approaches are and a little more of this and a little more of that uh, in uh, interpreting statutes. One last quick question uh, in the back. Well, thank you for coming, Justice Breyer. Uh, my question is, um, I don't suspect you'll give an answer on how the court will rule on the current Microsoft case, but, um, but I don't I, think we've even conferenced it yet, have we? <laughs> but but I am concerned about if the uh, decision is decided a certain way that it could compromise, say, America's privileged position in the world of technology as it is today. And I was curious if the court considers uh, things like that. The uh, position that we I'm have. I'm sure the arguments will be made in all of the briefs. And, <laughs> and uh, what, what that is a good example of and what you're bringing up in, in general terms. And it's an, uh, to me, this is an interesting uh, and uh, not clear uh, point, which is the world, of course, in technology is changing. And uh, that affects a lot of areas of law. And though not necessarily involved in that case, I mean, what about privacy? And uh, what about uh, uh, you know, where does it come in? And, and how do we have to do some things? You even have to spy sometimes. At least some people think so. And, and uh, how does this all work? And, and how do we, all right, what I think of then to console myself is Tocqueville, whom I really recommend. 
And Tocqueville, who has just a genius and really was so far-sighted as to what this country is like, uh, he said what he sort of thinks of as he approaches the United States is the clamor. And what he means by the clamor, he means people are arguing about everything. Yeah, they do. And uh, he said that, um, oh, you know, they, they debate these things. Of course there'll have to be changes. Uh, uh, privacy is protected from, by everything from the law of trespass to, uh, uh, to the Fourth Amendment, and it's all many different ways on different things, and it was actually a lack of memory was great. You did something stupid in the middle of the village and the people looking out the window will forget. Wonderful. But the computer doesn't forget, nor does the film. That changes things, and how do we want to change it? Well, he says there's a clamor, and there is a clamor. There are people arguing. There are people going to meetings. There are people writing articles in the student newspaper or other newspapers or in journals. There's the ACLU. There's the Sheriff's Association. There are dozens of different groups, and there are many, many legislatures, towns, cities, states, the, the, the Congress, and they try things on in there through administrative rules, through, uh, through hearings, through statutes, and gradually something settles down, and they'll try this, and they'll change it. They'll do some other thing. And maybe eventually, after a lot of other people have put in a lot of other work, uh, we will maybe get a question. And the question will be, is what they decided within the bounds? See, that's what this document does. It sets bounds. That's it. It doesn't tell people what to do. It sets boundaries around what they can do. And that's what we decide, you see? So it really isn't going to be just us. And it shouldn't be. And I, I think in things like that, it's best when we come in last, or as long, late, wait as long as you can. Because others will then, through the more democratic processes, have ways of trying to work these things out. And you just give an, uh, uh, an example of that. But, uh, you know, my mother used to say, there is no view so crazy that there isn't somebody in this country who doesn't hold it. She said, and she, we lived in San Francisco. She said, they all live in Los Angeles. She said, <laughs> <laughs> That's it. But I see every day that in the court, not that they're crazy, they're not crazy. But it's a miracle, a miracle, that people of every race, every religion, every point of view have decided to come in there and dissolve, resolve their differences under law. And that's where well, you're all going to be participating in that. And you're all able, now and then, uh, to tell people who aren't even lawyers or judges why it's not such a bad idea to resolve their differences that way, even though sometimes they'll lose, and even though sometimes they lose when they shouldn't. There we are. Okay, thank you.